Okay, I'm right. sitting here with uh, with Shane Howard, and uh, we've just finished with the uh, the book launch of the Australia's Bird Watching Mega Spots at mm. Blarney Books in in Port Ferry, and we've had a wonderful turnout, and we've uh, we've uh, been graced with uh, your presence, Shane, and we're we're very grateful for you coming. Well, um, uh, the pleasure is absolutely mine um, because it's uh, one it's a uh, it's an absolute treasure trove of the book. So, um, and um, I know how much work is involved, you know, in putting a book together and it's a massive undertaking just to index this stuff, um, let alone capture all the photos, collate all the photos, gather all that information. It's a massive amount of information. So it's a great treasure trove you've given us. Oh, thank you. And yeah, one of the goals of the book was to really try and put it in uh, a lot of information in an easy format yeah and thankfully tom my son he helped with the uh, the layout design of the very mm. first one uh, first uh, mega spot which was royal national park and from there it, it just became easy but mm. as you said there's a lot of information so very difficult to yeah but easy to get through it, it, it state by state um and then clearly defines uh then specific areas and you would have had a very specific target about uh, climate diversity and bird diversity, I'm sure, as the Definitely. book seems to represent. Um, yeah, the Hannah Lakes and um, um, and then, of course, the Western Treatment Plant, you know, it sounds like, doesn't sound like a place where you'd have a lot of diversity of wildlife, but you were saying it's actually one of the most diverse uh, species locations in the country it's actually yeah one of the top 10 in the world it's it's wow. australia's top one and it's it is a uh, a place that uh, it's great for the birds mm. not great for the smells but yeah uh, <laughs> right but the birds seem to love it yeah, yeah exactly yeah. right and there's a couple of others actually there's uh, lake kajelago that's got a treatment plant there's yeah. alice springs which they affectionately call the poo ponds and so yeah. I mean, this is kind of interesting too isn't it that actually our waste treatment turns out to be, because reed beds and those sort of wetland systems turn out to be incredibly um, important places for bird, birds, yep, for habitat and, and uh, yeah, so there's something there, you know, where we get the advantage of being able to have treatment and, um, but they also become repositories of um, mm. Species diversity. Exactly, and, and and an oasis in places like Alice Springs, where there yeah. isn't a lot of uh, abundance of fresh water around yeah, anyway. Right. So, so yeah, right. it, it becomes a particular water is yeah, yes, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. A little bit about you, though, Shane. I mean, mm. I, we're talking about the book tonight a little bit, but mm. you live locally um, mm. now. Have you always lived in this area? Grew up here, and uh, yeah, my great grandparents landed here from Ireland in about 1850. Okay. And um, you yeah, haven't gone very far. I've been around the country. Uh, there's not much in this country I haven't seen and been, had a good look at the world. Um, but inevitably I came back here. I know this place. It knows me um, for better and worse. Um, but it really is, in all my, for all my travels, and there are beautiful places. I love the Kimberleys. I love parts of, you know, um, Northern Queensland and the rainforest areas and uh, the east coast of New South Wales. Um, there's so many, uh, you know, a lifetime is really not enough to see Australia. Um, but I, this place holds, uh, um, not just because I grew up here, but, but because I think it's one of the most beautiful places mm -hmm. that I've seen in my travels. And I mean, that's why I'm such a, I guess, a, a dedicated and fierce advocate for protecting it because it, it um, Earlier this year, I was touring in the Arctic Circle in Canada, and um, we were right up at Inuvik, which is in the Arctic Circle. And there's a billboard there about the migratory birds, and there's the little ruddy turnstone on the board. And I thought, wow, the ruddy turnstone who lives here travels to Kalani Beach, mm. and uh, yeah, from one end of the world to the other, uh, all 19 grams of him. Um, feeds up and returns again. So, I mean, um, the, um, where we live, um, when I first went there, 20, first shifted to the house there 20 years ago, um, OB, orange-bellied parrots would turn up and 
a lot of the time they would be in the Boxthorn Hedge, which has since been cleared by parks. And I wonder if that was a wise idea because mm. they might, it may well have been a sort of safe um, place for them. We've just in the last few years had um, uh, first, the year before last, we had one lone Cape Barren Goose turn up. Last year we had seven and I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. But we, it used to be abundant um, through here. Every now and then you'll see uh, a brolga come by. Um, Kingfishers come by, um, little um, Jackie Winters, and um, such a diversity of bird life. Because we're on a we're on a wetland behind the dune system, mm -hmm. so you've got all the beautiful coastal bird life, and then you've got the the, the wetland, which at different times of the year there's an incredible. Uh, how the birds know, I have no idea, but they know when to turn up and when it's perfect for them. Yep. Uh, and it's a constant source of, of fascination, you know, to um, to live with the birds. The swans rule the place. It's black swan country, really. Mm -hmm. They own the wetland. Um, but then all the uh, raptors, all the the diversity of raptors. Tower Hill's just up the road. Um, so we have an incredible diversity just in our own backyard, and mm -hmm. it's a constant source of wonder. And it, and it is, you need that diversity for a healthy ecosystem and that's, that's you know, everything yeah. from the, 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 the invertebrates we don't see yeah, right through to the, the top end predators, it, it all goes hand in hand and as you said, the, the box thorn bushes and things like that, that different species depend on them and, and you yeah. remove one element and... Without the, replacing it. And you can't and fix yeah. the jigsaw. That's yeah, all. and look, this is a damaged landscape. I mean, this, the Belfast Coast Reserve is a very thin strip, it's a of wild, wildness, all that's left, and even that is in recovery. Um, the area, this area, Western Victoria, was so heavily cleared, you know, in the colonial times. People were terribly busy, and um, the because the um, the casuarinas that would have gone right to the you know, primary dunes, right to the to the to the beach, um, bird hotter than red gum, they were some of the first things to go. So. The ecosystem is in recovery, and you don't have to do a lot, really, from my own observations, just leave it alone. Um, some replanting, which has been done by some of the coast care groups and stuff, but um, really, you know, neglect is a very useful thing sometimes, just to let places be. Um, and how you deal then with one of the big issues for a place that's popular, like Port Ferry, and between Port Ferry and Warrnambool, with tourists and population increase pressures is how to protect those migratory and resident shorebird breeding areas. So the area is under a lot of pressure historically. It's in recovery, but then there are modern pressures coming. So, mm -hmm. um, but it is so rich in, uh, in its reptile life. I mean, of, you know, there are, you know, red belly black snakes, there's um, copperheads, tigers, um, there's blue tongues, there's echidnas, um, there used to be wombats, uh, which you never see anymore in this part of the world. There are um, uh, long-necked tortoises, there's uh, swamp wallabies are making a comeback in numbers. Um, there's a lot to marvel at in, you know, in your own backyard, really. And, yeah, and, and um, I was lucky uh, last month, I was down here and Chris took me to to the beach and we had a, a walk along the beach and it wasn't it was a bit late in the day but it's mm. it's stunning and yeah, with chris's aerials to see it from the air it's even more stunning but yeah well chris chris gave us a view of our own country uh, from the air that we never had before mm. and when you see the lay of the coastline and the lay of the reef structures it is unique in the sense that there aren't many places in australia i don't know in the world where you have basalt reefs um that are fairly recent, you know, Tower Hill, um, well, actually they're not from Tower Hill, they're from Mount Napier, which is only 10 or 11,000 years old. So they're big lava outpourings that must have gone on for years. Um, and of course, this was a rich, um, Aboriginal people here were not nomadic. They didn't have to be. There's fresh water, food abundance, you know, seafood in the summer, um, inland species, eggs, um, 
just rich, rich habitat, and I think it would have housed uh, one of the densest populations right. of Aboriginal people, possibly in the country. Um, so it's rich in Aboriginal history, the midden sites, the, um, the, the ephemeral dreaming stories. Um, so this little 21 kilometre stretch between Port Ferry and Warrnambool, which is unique because when you go east of Warrnambool, it turns into the Great Ocean Road and those, you know, um, yeah, the, the Twelve Apostles, yeah. the big high sandstone cliffs. And when you go west, it turns into sandstone cliffs again too. Okay. So it's quite a unique low-lying area um, that is where the conditions are just ideal. And that's why the bird life is so rich there and so, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. so densely populated. Fantastic. And um, away from the the, um, the wildlife stuff, mm. obviously, you know, you've got a, a massive history in, in music making and, and singing and, mm. and everything else. We've, we've been with Goanna for, for yeah. many years. And are you, you're touring as an individual or have you been touring with other yeah. people at the moment? <coughs> well... Um, I never stop working because I have to pay for the kids' Wi-Fi, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, it, uh, yeah, and look, I went and finished up in about 1986 and, you know, I immediately had to transition into being Shane Howard and everyone, you know, everyone knew who Goanna was but who Shane Howard. So I had to start all over again. Um, but I've, I've never stopped working, mm. um, you know, writing, you know, there's hundreds of songs. Um, you know, everyone knows Solid Rock or, you know, Razor's Edge or whatever. But there's hundreds of songs and I have to love them all equally. Uh, and I love the process of, of writing. And for me, um, the, um, the rough deal that Aboriginal people got in this country is very close to my heart. And Solid Rock threw me head first into Aboriginal Australia. And it's confronting. And but it's been incredibly ritually rewarding. Um, that song opened a lot of doors for me into places that I never imagined I'd see or be, and to meet some remarkable people, mm -hmm. and to have that uh, Aboriginal understanding of country that is so deep and so rich. Um, you know, the dreaming story for the Willy Wagtail. Why so? His courage epitomised, mm -hmm. and he has his own dance. Um, to celebrate his courage. So many of the Brolga, all these birds have dances, you know, and they have stories. Yep. And some of these are the oldest archetypal stories on earth. So there's that rich treasure trove that's opened up for me that um, is extraordinary. Um, that's also opened up for me. As a kid, I roamed the Belfast Coast Reserve um, and I loved the wildness of the back beach at Levy's and stuff. So. Um, to then come back as an older man and know that there's deep, rich Aboriginal stories about that country I grew up in that I didn't know back then. Uh, and the love of nature that has uh, has only deepened for me in my travels around Australia. I, I This is an incredible country, um, you know, an old, old continent. And uh, so a lot of that seeps its way into song. Yep. And... Uh, and into life and uh, you know, being a dad as well is a really important part of, of mm. that life and sharing that stuff with your kids. A love of nature, a love of music um, and uh, you know, literature and poetry, Tim Winton's writings, you know, when he writes about the coast or when he writes about West Australia and about the landscape, I think he's absolutely at his best. Um, so the... Uh, and. Bruce Pascoe talks a lot about um, how we need to learn to love our country. White fellas, mm. uh, you know, and um, that we need to learn to love our country in a deeper way. And I, I do love that notion that um, I know how that sense of Aboriginal landscape, um, that, you know, 60,000 years of understanding. That's right, and you respect. Know, That's yeah, right, yeah, that... Uh, the detail, you know, to walk out in, into the desert country in the APY lands and be shown a rock that's no bigger, you know, than, uh, not much bigger than a football. And it's in the ground, to, how would you, in the middle of a desert, how would you even know it's there unless you know the country intimately? And of course, 
to understand the story of that rock and how it interconnects with everything else. Song lines that travel for 1,500 kilometres. Um, this intimate love and knowledge of landscape. Um, you know, um, I wish I had another lifetime. Yes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had a little bit more time. But, yeah. but thank you very much for coming tonight and thank you very much for sitting down and having a chat with us. No worries, Peter. Um, Pleasure. Thank you so much for... Um, the book and what it reveals to us, it deepens our understanding of, the, of where we are. Great. Thank you.